Thank you for listening to Nomad's Movie Reviews Podcast, available on Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, and Stitcher. Also, please follow Matt's Movie Reviews on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, Reddit, Instagram, and MeWe. And of course, be sure to visit mattsmoviereviews.net for the latest reviews, top 10 lists, and more. Now, on to the show. I felt her evil the second she got out of that car. Rosalie exhibits signs of psychopathy. He could have been killed, honey. He wasn't. Are you saying she's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? Cursed. She's just a little lost. All the bad stuff started happening when you guys got here. How does an 80-year-old woman get up in a tree like that? The Harbinger has come. The Harbinger is a traveler doomed to hell unless he does the devil's bidding. We all end up the same way. She is a sweet child. Cursed! There has to be another way! It's dark as a black hole. The Dark Lord. The devil has my daughter. He's been summoned. I can see him burning in hell. And he has forced me to do something terrible in order to get her back. There is no prayer. It's pure evil. Or chant. Or song. That can save your daughter. Hello and welcome to the Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast. I am your host, Matthew Perkovich, and this is episode number 457. Out now in theatres across the US and on demand is The Harbinger, a horror mystery that centres on a family man who must deal with an evil entity that has his um, eyes set on his daughter. A unique and intriguing supernatural thriller, The Harbinger is also the latest film from Will Klipstein, who also stars in the film and co-wrote the script. I'm glad to say that Will joins me now on the podcast. Will, how are you today? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. And do you go by Matthew or Matt? Matt's fine. Matt, okay. Um, You know, it's really interesting, this movie. It's a film with many elements to it. You know, it is very much a horror story, but... It's also a family drama, deals with folklore, deals with, deals with theology and mythology. It's a, f- a film that you co-wrote with Amy Mills. And I was really curious, the initial genesis of the movie, that starting point of the film that kind of spirals out into what we see of what people will see in front of them. What was that first kind of thing that really kind of sparked this story? And how did that kind of flourish into the, the, the film that we see today? Woo! You're going to start off deep. All right. Um, okay. The genesis of this movie, first of all, you know, William Freakins, The Exorcist, he, it's been done. We didn't want to be that. Um, uh, Richard Donner, The Omen. I mean, Juan with The Conjuring. How do you, you know, you're not going to compete with anything like that. We didn't want to do any straight up horror. We wanted this to be paranormal Hitchcock. Hmm. You know, it's mystery. It's lore. It's got suspense it's thriller um one of the things you know i know marketing and 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 uh and filmmaking are two separate skill sets but the marketing people really push this as like a straight up horror movie Hmm. and what's missing from the trailer for me is the mysticism and the lore aspect of it that really is is what i love the most about this movie and you know i thought wouldn't it be cool because I wanted to just make a movie that I would want to go see in the theater. And I thought, or, you know, on demand, whatever. And I thought, well, you know, wouldn't it be cool if you just start out in just, you know, your typical suburban neighborhood, boring as a mystery, like Hitchcock said, you know, mystery is when the audience knows less than the character. And suspense has been, of course, when the audience is in on it. So I wanted to start off a movie as a mystery in a boring neighborhood, slowly feed the audience as we go through this mystical lore and this unique original world of a horror like a that type of horror that you haven't seen before not a slasher not gore not a demon slash possession movie i wanted to do something different um and take them on that journey 
and, and you know, especially juxtapose, you know, different mythologies against each other, see what, what that might look like. But, um, and then we end up at a certain point at the end of the movie in a location that I don't know if it's a spoiler or not, but you're basically, you know, I don't think it gives away spoilers because they're never going to guess the twist. Mm. But I thought, wouldn't it be cool to see a movie where you start off in a boring neighborhood and you end up at the end in the crypt in a face off with the devil? Mm. What would that look like? How do you get from point A to point B and tell a compelling story and have a bunch of twists where they're never going to guess? I just combined all those elements and Amy and I co-wrote it together. And um, I, I can't wait for audiences to discover this because you're going to see this trailer and you know, you're going to get that pushback. You're always going to have those people that watch the movie and they, the trailer, they saw the trailer and they're wanting the exorcist, the omen. They're going to want something like that. And then they're going to see something completely different. And the reactions are going to be drastically on both ends of the spectrum. You're going to have those that are that see it and go, wow, this is different. And you're going to have the others that are going to be like, this wasn't the omen. You know, so I get it. I get the whole marketing thing versus like what the film actually is and all that. And what's really interesting, which I can't figure out. I'm getting a lot of nice feedback from males, but like the feedback, it's like twice as much from women. That's not intentional. I don't know. I don't know what it is. Is it that? you know, it's not a pure horror movie and that, you know, what was the, who was the director? I thought it was Hitchcock. And then I looked it up and it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, I couldn't find it attributed to him, but someone said horror is when you can't look at the screen and suspense is when you can't take your eyes off it. So right. I've got this like thinly veiled layer of, of horror over that you lift it up and you, and then you've got that solid story that just keeps you involved all the way through. Sorry if that was short winded. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, what I really, what I really um, bought into what you just said then was that the whole point about the marketing versus the expectations in the films. I like to be surprised when I watch a movie because I watch so many of them, right? And the whole kind of, <laughs> I get so many sent to me and I watch them. And what I loved about the Harvard Joe was that I liked the fact that it was different to what I was expecting because I, I, I want that. Um, and what I really enjoy about what Harbinger does is that you were talking before about the clashing of different kind of philosophies and theology. So on one end, it's kind of like you've got a, you know, usually when it comes to kind of like demonic possession movies, it deals with Catholic theology. Right. And the, the family itself, like your character and your family, especially the um, character of your wife, she's very much a Catholic. She wears her rosary um, uh, in, in the film. Uh, and the, the town itself seems to be sensed around a Catholic parish. Yeah. It's around and I'm, I'm a Catholic myself, so that was kind of something that was intriguing to me. But then on the other end, you deal with Native American folklore as well. And I think the only real time I've ever seen that in the film was the prophecy, um, the movie to start Christopher Walker, like back in the, in the mid 90s, um, where I saw kind of like both kind of like um, uh, mythologies and theologies kind of clashing together. Um, when it came to this film, how did it come to that you had these two kind of opposing kind of spiritual kind of world points kind of come together and meld itself into the one kind of thing? Are you interested in both kind of like uh, 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 things in terms of a religion, theological and mythology, uh, mythological standpoint? Or was it something that you felt that hasn't been done before and you wanted to see what it was like when you kind of put them together in a one gumbo and see what it come out as? It's the latter. Um, the executive producers uh, are Native American. Um, and I, I thought to myself, well, that could be interesting to combine those two mythologies and what might that look like? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but I did consult with seven different tribes to make sure I wasn't going to put anything offensive in the movie. Right. Um, because I knew, I know that's a, that's a, that's a tightrope walk right there, but what I got back, the feedback I got from them was all positive. And, and they said it adds to the mystique. And the Lord, if you don't say the specific tribe, and as a matter of fact, the way the project evolved, we don't actually ever even say what state we're in. There was an old version of the script that said, you know, it's the only tribe, you know, east of the, it was a certain tribe you know, east of the Mississippi. But then we took that out too. Uh, it, being vague there was, it added to the lore. I don't even think we actually, yeah, no, we don't say the state that they're living in. No, to me, it seemed I mean, like we took that out. Yeah, to me, it seemed like any town you would say. Um, and I think that was kind of like almost the point because your character being a salesman, I imagine him going from town to town. Every town will look the same after a while, anyway. <laughs> you got, man, you got it all, man. 
that was all in one viewing. You picked all that up. I mean, you've already said so much. I'm like, you guys, you watched this movie once. <laughs> yes, <sir. laughs> you got it all. I it's take dense. Notes. Yeah, it's dense. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, this we wanted we. This is a thinking person's type of horror, hmm. and I know that a lot of times with horror films, you just want to see that monster movie. This is a thinking type, you know, thinking person's uh, type of horror, and you you will be fed. You will be fed, but it'll be it's a slow feeding. And then we unload everything on you in, in, the, in the third act. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a, this movie was designed to be fun. You know, you can call it gateway horror, you know, a 12 year old, 11 year old uh, could probably watch this depending on the parents. I don't know about a 10 year old. I think maybe a nine year old would be too scary, but I would call this movie speaky, uh, spooky and creepy, not necessarily, uh, you know, a movie of jump scares and that kind of thing. I don't, mm. We might have one or two jump scares in the movie, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't call this hardcore horror or straight up horror at all. The thing that's really interesting about the Harbinger <clears throat> 2 is that a lot of the movie has to do with symbols and artifacts. Um, artifacts yeah. especially have like a really big kind of prominent part in the film. When it comes to your kind of like um, researching, especially with regards to like um, Native American folklore and stuff, the artifacts themselves, are they kind of inspired <clears throat> by anything kind of real in regards yeah. to uh, what, what you kind of came across? You know, we have supernatural and mystical elements in this film, you know, and when you're dealing with something like, you know, paranormal Harry Potter stuff, you know, with relics and things like that, obviously they don't exist. But we had to build an entire mythology for this movie. You have to research what relic does what. You have to establish the rules and then you have to go through each thing in the script and find out, uh oh, uh, where are we breaking those rules? Then it causes a ripple effect. You have to go back and change everything else in the script to follow those rules. And every time you change a rule, it's the ripple effect again, and you got to go change the rules. So the challenging thing about this movie, we researched artifacts and things like that, but we obviously, we made up all the paranormal aspects of it and the supernatural elements of that. But then when we made the rules for each of it, we, we basically built a, myth a mythological world for this movie. The Harbinger, I don't want to give away spoilers, but the Harbinger is a new mythology mm. that we have created. Um, that's another thing the trailer doesn't, I, I appreciate what the marketing people are doing, but that's another thing the trailer doesn't really, it does point that out, but that's a big element of this movie. It's a big element. I know the trailer has got to be like, boom, 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 boom. But, um, you know, I'm trying to be honest because I think, I think you make a promise as a filmmaker, you make a promise, you keep a promise. And so, you know, hopefully someday I'll be in a position where I can, you know, have more of a say over the, you know, the contents of the trailer. But I, I, I think the trailer's got a lot of elements of our film in it, but I, I just, I think a lot of people will be the ones that are just looking for the straight up horror, you know, they'll, they'll be like, what is but is wait, there's more here. We want to do something deeper. We don't want, we wanted to do something more original, more unique is what I'm trying to say. The Matt's Movie Reviews podcast is brought to you by T Public. T Public is the world's largest marketplace for independent creators to sell their work on the highest quality merchandise. With over 1.2 million designs, T Public is sure to have something you love. You know what the Harvard Joint kind of reminds me of? It kind of reminds me of uh, like kind of like those old school things series like Salem's Lot, where it's kind of like based in one town, but then you've got like different converging elements kind of based around the one kind of central horror kind of thing. Kind of reminds me of yeah. like that. And it's interesting when you talk about the trailer. To me, when I've watched trailers, and I've got my own kind of like gripes and stuff with them, but to me, they're kind of like the first single from an album. You know, the first single from an album is kind of like the one thing that like that wants to get you hooked in, hooked into the album. But when you listen to the whole album, it doesn't really necessarily represent the single <laughs> as a whole you know what i mean that's what it kind of more than me. words by uh extreme, extreme. i yeah, bought that the, album yeah, yeah I, I got the Great album. song i love extreme i got the album right here right behind yeah. it. yeah I, mean, I, I like it yeah. but you know it was the only song that sounded like that and then mm. no yeah no i totally get it mm. i 110 percent yeah. marketing is its thing over here and then you've got your what the product really is you know when <laughs> you watch it and I'm excited for people. I think over time it will correct itself. You know, it's just like, oh, okay. You know, this is a different type of horror movie, and it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a mystery, suspense, thriller, lore thing where we can just experience it. And and no one's going to guess the twists. Hmm. They're not going to guess the twists. 
No, well, I definitely didn't. That's why I kind of like I really appreciated about it. Another thing I appreciated about it is um the performance of Madeline the Crawl. I mean, she really came through this um this year. Like this is just the second feature release this year because the Black Phone came out this year as well. She was terrific in that movie as well. You talked before about the um kind of like the creepy kid trope when you mentioned about the omen and the exorcist and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. Um we but the interesting thing about Madeline in this film is that when we, we first see the character of, of Rosalie in this movie, straight away you know something's not right. Um and there could be so certain things. I know I know some um uh reviewers <clears throat> wrote down uh possibly autistic and stuff like that. I know, I don't buy into that. My, I got an autistic son myself and I was like, I never saw that. No, myself, there's no you know? yeah, no suggestion of autism in that at all. No, me, I, like, I, I didn't, I didn't, you know, I don't know where they get that from. But it's interesting when you see it, because usually in movies, um, there's a kind of like a, a build towards the, um, uh, what's the word, what's the word I'm trying to say? There's usually a build in regards to the creepy kid trope where, like, at first they see kind of normal and kind of, like, progresses into kind of like these d- descent into kind of like the supernatural. As soon as you see kind of Rosalind in the movie, straight away you know um, that, like, something's not right. I mean, you have flashbacks which which show like this, you know how she was as a real uh, actual kid. Um, when when you you know you need to have an actor to really kind of pull that off, um, and you really found in Madeline, what was it like casting her, working with her in this movie? Um, and I don't know about you, but I think she definitely has like a big future ahead of her um, in regards to uh, oh yeah, uh, no Madeline, Hollywood and such. Yeah. Yeah, Maddie is one of those uh, like you've heard this about Dakota Fanning when she was five years old. People said that she behaved like an adult. Right. Like, oh, who is this 30 year old? You know, but um, sorry, I have allergies. <coughs> oh, me too. <laughs> um, there was originally a, a girl named Ivy George, uh, dear friends from my old acting studio. Uh, it was her daughter, working actor, uh, with a big little eyes with Nicole Kidman. And her schedule couldn't work out. She was going to play my daughter. And uh, Krista, Ivy's mom, so selfless. She, you know, if somebody can't do a movie, very rarely does that actor say, well, here are three other brilliant actors. Why don't you use one of them? Mm. And that's what she did. And we called them in. Uh, they put it on tape. We called them in. I think we called in three, uh, three out of the five or something like that. They were all brilliant. But Maddie has this vulnerability that also looks like she could whoop your ass. Like, I really really wanted to put my arms around her and save her like and rescue her like you know in her audition she she was so vulnerable you have to know that she can play all those vulnerable parts first then you go to the whole evil thing right mm-hmm. a lot of people can play evil but can you be emotionally vulnerable like you said there's a family drama element underneath all of what's going on you got to have that person yeah uh, the thing about this, I didn't want to just do a unique original movie. I wanted, I wanted the emotional state to be like at 11, you know, and Maddie can do all of that. So can Steve Monroe, the guy that played the neighbor, all of them, they can all do it. And uh, they were all brilliant. And Maddie, Maddie uh, is no exception at all. The other thing I love about the Harbinger in regards to the casting is um, just how unique a lot of the faces are in regards to some of these characters so you have like um, Charles Chabelle who plays. Uh, I'm not going to say who he plays to skip away, but as soon as you <laughs> well, see they can him, IMDb it. <laughs> as soon as soon as you see him, you know <clears throat> something's up. Um, I definitely think that Diana Wilde would come come to playing that the character kind of like the almost always like the um, the PTA kind of like unofficial mayor of the town. The way that she really <laughs> smiles and laughs, you know something's up going there. I definitely think Bruce Bone as kind of like the, the creepy man. Like he especially, I think he has a really good face for horror. And horror is really interesting that in the history of it, the faces of a lot of the actors, from Peter Law to you know uh, yeah. uh, Christopher Lee and, and onwards and onwards. I mean, they really have to fill the frame because a lot of times, like first impressions do count when it comes to a lot of these characters, either to introduce who they're going to be or to do a swerve and then go against that. And later. How about that voice? How about exactly, um, voice. I mean, I of mean, course, you don't hear it for a long time. No, you don't. <laughs> Um, but before you do see him, but the whole point about what I'm saying with the faces is that a lot of times they can just by looking at it say a thousand things about the character before even saying anything. Um, and I think that's really kind of interesting in this movie. I mean, how important was it to trying to get those those actors who can not only, of course, play the role because they're great actors, but having that kind of look to them as well that really kind of personified exactly who these people are, but you don't exactly know for sure um, because it's really good in a psychological kind of sense uh, of connecting with the audience. You, you know, you'll hear 
<clears throat> excuse me, you'll hear um, casting directors and <clears throat> other directors, they'll say things like, you know, I felt it when they walked in the room. You'll, mm. hear, you'll hear that a lot. And like Bruce, for example, he walked in the room and I was like, holy shit. Look at this guy. Like just presence to the, to the, to the gills. And then he sits down and opens his mouth and I'm like, stop, you've got the part. It's done. You know, it's like you just strike gold sometimes. And uh, yeah, you know, a lot of times it, it, it is, they say 90% of directing is, is casting brilliant actors and letting them make you look good. And that, that, that there's a lot of truth to that. You, you cast brilliant actors and that's a lot of work in pre-production. But then when you get into production, you have to trust that actor to do what they, what they do. But a lot of times, you know, you'll have what you need and you'll just kind of whisper in the actor's ear, you know, Hey, you know, we got what we want. What, how about in this next take, just do whatever you want. A lot of times that's the take that ends up in the movie. So, I mean, it's, it's really, it's a really interesting kind of like hodgepodge of characters and actors here and just like the mythologies and such. And I really recommend people check out the Harbinger because as I said before, I like to be surprised when I watch, uh, watch a movie. I like to see something that kind of goes against the grain and gives me something a little more innovative, a little more creative. And I think the Harbinger really ticked those boxes for me. Cause you know, as you said before, we've done the exercise. Sometimes when, you know, um, um, a new band comes out and it sounds exactly like Black Sabbath. I always say, why do I need to listen to that when I've got Black Sabbath? You know what I mean? Right, right, um, right. So exactly. for, pe- for, for, for people out there, out now in the theaters across the US and also in digital, The Harbinger, I really recommend people check this film out. As I said, it kind of does remind me of kind of like those old school miniseries, kind of like films like Salem's Lot. A little bit of phantasm as well in the day. It's kind of like based in a small town and you've got like this kind of like central kind of evil aspect to it that kind of spreads out and affects people in different ways and in regards to family relations and such i think it's a really interesting movie and i, I really want to say will it's been a pleasure talking to you today and um best of luck with the, the movie you've got another movie coming out in the future please reach out i'd love to talk to you again and watch your film and uh, thank you so much yeah man it's been really really cool talking to you thank you matt i appreciate that thank you so much thank you for watching the matt's movie reviews channel please subscribe for more reviews podcast interviews, and exclusive content. Also, if you would like to request a review and support my work, please join my Patreon via the link in the description below.